Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for coming uh, for the first lecture in the MSCDP Conversations with Practitioners lecture series. For those of you who don't know me, and it looks like there's a few, so there's a good amount of potentially AAD students here. Uh, my name is Adam Vosberg, and I am the Assistant Director of Computational Design Practices, along with Laura Kurgan, who is the director of the program. And then for those of you who don't know the program itself, CDP is an MS program in only its second year that introduces students to a range of possibilities for design work at the intersection of architecture, urbanism, and computation. It mixes critical perspectives on computation and practice with a commitment to design and action in multiple dimensions, social, political, technical, aesthetic, and more. So this lecture series is designed to introduce students to practitioners who are working with computation in various media and subject matters at a wide variety of scales. In the spirit of recognizing exciting practitioners that are doing this work, there is no better person to kick off the lecture series than Curry J. Hackett. Curry Hackett is a transdisciplinary designer, public artist, and educator. His practice, Wayside, synthesizes cultural and ecological narratives to envision meaningful work in the public realm. Noteworthy projects include the Howard Theater Walk of Fame and the DC High Watermark Project. Hackett began his academic career in 2019 at his alma mater, Howard University, and has since taught at Yale University, Carleton University, City College of New York, University of Tennessee, Knoxville, and is a core member of the anti-racist design justice school, Dark Matter U. Currently, Curry is completing his Master's of Architecture in Urban Design at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. In 2022, Hackett was named an inaugural Journal of Architectural Education Fellow and a finalist of the Harvard GSD Wheelwright Prize. In 2023, Hackett won the Association of Collegiate Schools of Architecture Creative Achievement Award for his Subjective Water Studio, which explored black culture and water and was named a grantee by the Graham Foundation for his ongoing research project, Trilongso, which explores relationships between blackness, geography, and land. Personally, after seeing his high watermark project in a couple of places, I first consciously came across Curry Hackett's work in his collaborative um, essay with Charles Davis II, on efflux architecture. Since then, I have been following the AI Black History series on Instagram, which really stood out to me among the deluge of content created by generative AI tools as an exemplary example of what this could do for us. So without further ado, we'll get, we'll have a, we'll get started. We'll have a brief Q&A afterwards, so make sure to take the opportunity to ask some questions or share thoughts about Curry's work. Um, thanks again for coming and joining me again and welcoming Curry Hackett. Good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. Ah, oh, there we go. All right. Um, thanks again, Adam, for that lovely intro. Um, I'm the guy on the poster. You didn't know. Um, so I'm going to talk to you all for a little bit uh, about, I'm going to start off kind of just talking about what, uh, who I am, where I'm from, uh, why I think the way, why, why I'm like this. Um, and then I'll get into uh, a little bit of the work uh, some of the built work uh, that Adam mentioned that kind of situates um, how I've been thinking about uh, how uh, data, both qualitative and quantitative, starts to show up in my work. And then I'll maybe kind of wrap up with a few thoughts uh, on some AI experiments that I've been doing. Um, you might have seen some of those on Instagram. Um, yeah, so let's get in a little bit. So um, I always like to start with, uh, just to be a bit autobiographical for a second, and, and it, I think it will help to kind of situate the work a bit. Um, but I grew up in a small town in southern Virginia called Farmville. Um, it's probably about 20,000 folks in the county. Um, my, uh, I grew up actually near my, my family's uh, farmland that we've owned uh, since about the Reconstruction era, since the 1870s or so at least to my, uh, to my knowledge. Um, this is a photo of me on the right of me, uh, I guess, me helping my great uncle uh, feed the chickens. Um, but I, I, I really love um, kind of starting off with uh, talking about this place because um, it really kind of stitches together so much, so many of my thoughts around uh, place, memory, um, imagination, resistance, agency, all of those things, and my, my kind of fascination with plants. All of that um, is kind of collapsed onto this 100 acres or so of, of land um, that, uh, you know, it stretches several generations. Um, 
And so this is, this is a, just a very special um, uh, place for me. Um, I left Farmville in 2008 um, to go to Washington, D.C., uh, which is another special place. Uh, went there to go to Howard University. Um, for those that don't know, Howard is uh, predominantly a historically black institution in the kind of heart of D.C. Um, it was founded in 1867, um, and I, I went there for architecture school, but was really fascinated with how, um, you know, this is just this, I kind of call it almost like a magical place where so many different kinds of black folks uh, show up from all the aspects of the diaspora, black folks that are speaking five langu languages, black folks playing chess, black folks from Kansas, black folks from the projects, black folks, you know, um, literal African royalty, I'm not kidding. Um, you know, you might be sitting in class next to someone, there's, their father is, you know, the ambassador to Jamaica. Um, and so it's just like all these different aspects of blackness that kind of kind of get collapsed into this, you know, few acres of campus in the middle of a, just a funny moment. Um, that was hilarious when Drake came, came to campus. Um, that kind of, uh, you know, again, stitched together so many aspects of, of, of blackness and really kind of expanded my understanding of what blackness is and can mean. Um, and, and I like to put these two places, Farmville and Howard, in contact with each other because um, they constitute what I and I think many others have called a, a black landscape. So essentially the idea is it, uh, this land or a place that's designed and built uh, for and by black folks, right? For, for a variety, for kind of, that enables sort of a multiplicity of, of things to occur. Um, but also I think for me, it's, it's useful to not think of landscape, the black landscape not necessarily as something uh, as just flowers or farming or, or plants uh, or, or the literal land, but it's, I like to think of the black landscape as a kind of repository or, or a substrate for memory and imagination um, and, and, and meaning and, and memory and all that good stuff. So this is just me kind of starting to um, think into, um, think into like why, like how, how and, and why I, I want to kind of research and practice and teach, right? Um, a lot of that thinking uh, on the black landscape has kind of shown up um, in a lot of different ways, um, particularly in uh, my teaching of the last few years, both the how and the what I, I you know, was teaching. Um, I, in 2020, um, joined uh, the Dark Matter U network. Um, several of those members actually teach here at GSAP. Jalisa Bloomberg uh, is one. Jerome Hayford, who used to teach here, is another. I co-taught classes with both of those folks. Um, the one on the left was a studio module that Jalisa and I co-taught at Carleton University in Ottawa. That was called For With, an individual practice towards collective expression. Um, the other was called Fugitive Practice. And these were both sort of, um, I'll focus on the studio, um, uh, the first iteration of that studio. But these were both looking at sort of um, putting that idea of the black landscape kind of into practice, right? And, and looking at, in the studio's case, looking at black um, diasporic modes of performance to kind of unpack new sort of emergent means of thinking about place, about urban space, um, and then on the right was more so looking at black sort of in the, in indigenous material culture, like craft. Uh, we looked at quilting and a bunch of different things. Um, this, this is some of the um, outtakes, I guess, from the syllabus of the studio, where we gathered a bunch of um, black uh, sort of means of performance from all over the diaspora. Um, Jalisa is coming from the Panamanian context, so she was bringing some really cool like Afro-Latina um, uh, tropes from, from South and Central America. I'm from obviously the American South, so, um, and she has spent a good time in, amount of time in Texas. So we were, we were having a lot of fun um, inviting the students to find value in the black everyday or the so-called mundane, the so-called banal. Um, these were some of the, um, some of the drawings that the student, we had the students do to uh, sort of unpack the, um, socio-spatial, sort of socio-cultural potential of these uh, different tropes, this is double dutch. Um, this student created a notational system for go-go, uh, or beat, beating your feet, which is a, a dance done to go-go, which is a very hyper-regional uh, genre um, local to DC. 
Um, and then I landed uh, at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville, um, which was very, very different than teaching at Howard, um, uh, which is where I started my career, teaching career. Mostly black students, actually all black students, mostly black women, uh, teaching you know, at, at, at Howard and then um, a very white state school in the mountains um, you know, in Tennessee. But nevertheless was still um, invited and empowered to um, think really critically about how, again, this black landscape idea kind of gets put into practice and also just having fun with the idea of um, this notion that black studies kind of beneficial for everyone. It's beneficial for, for, for every aspect of the discipline. And we can think really, um, we can think really radically about what, uh, um, you know, how we produce place, how, we, how space gets transcended into place. Um, and there's a lot of richness and sophistication in looking at the black every day. Or in, in other words, everyday means of cultural production and, and kind of every, everyday black life. Um, how, like, what is the value, inviting the students to find value in that, in, in that, um, those cultural kind of products. Um, typically, uh, you know, in, in a lot of black culture, diaspora, diaspora culture, there's less concern for um, uh, sort of hard boundaries between indoor and outdoor, uh, public and private, individual and collective. Um, and so these were two of those courses that I taught at the University of Tennessee. Um, the one on the right is what I'll focus on a little bit. This is the subject of Water Studio, um, in which we looked at uh, water and how water shows up in different ways in black culture, um, be it the, the uh, you know things like curls and waves, and uh, sorry, waves and hair, um, or as drip. Uh, you think about ice uh, and, and jewelry and kind of decadence in, in a lot of black especially Southern culture, but also um, water as a kind of, uh, as a geographical feature and, and, and uh, how loaded um, things like the, the Atlantic Ocean is, for instance, in, in, in black history. Um, we used a lot of uh, kind of collage as a, as a verb that semester. It was a lot of fun getting the students to um, think and kind of world build in a way that was uh, liberated from you know Euclidean geometry and and and, and things like perspective and scale um, and uh, really just kind of be dreamy and optimistic uh, we and we started off with this kind of curated playlist of, of different songs uh, by black artists that mention water in different ways and all of this is just to get the students kind of comfortable with uh, working in these kind of messy live uh, ways on top of each other hyper collectively um, and again kind of like y using um, black means of cultural production kind of mapping that on to um, contemporary sort of or traditional architectural uh, education methods to kind of crack open new ways of learning new ways of making um, and then finally we, we ended up with this sort of uh, we ended up imagining like a, a community for like 500 people from scratch and uh, the final review actually was still kind of a charrette. Um, and this is just funny, the students surprised me by putting me in all of their drawings. I didn't realize that that was a thing. Um, anyway, moving on. Uh, so I have been, since about 2015, um, started um, a practice wayside which as the name maybe suggests, is ultimately um, a kind of ongoing effort to unpack uh, value of, you know, of, of the everyday, a value of uh, trying to surface under-recognized narratives, marginalized narratives. Um, as I've been saying more recently, uh, I think of Wayside as a kind of celebration not only of the margin, but also of the marginal and the marginalized. Um, and so that typically ends up showing up in um, public art, city commissioned public art up to this point in DC. The first major work uh, of that was the Howard Theater Walk of Fame. Um, this was uh, a major, or more, this was city's second largest um, public funded project uh, in recent memory. Um, this was down the street from Howard's campus in front of the Howard Theater. The Howard Theater, uh, you can think of as kind of like the Apollo Theater of DC. It was like a the kind of anchor of this uh, black cultural corridor used to be known as Black Broadway at that time. 
And so the city wanted to honor that history um, with a series of 15 um, bronze medallions that uh, uh, depict um, likenesses of folks like Ella Fitzgerald, Cab Calloway. So it becomes this sort of wayfinding uh, device um, in, in the Shaw streetscape. This is my first sort of foray into trying to um, consider culture in a, in, a, in, a, in a really robust way and then trying to translate that directly into the streetscape. I think this second project, the High Watermark Project, which is sort of ongoing, I think this is really the first time where like big D data shows up in my work. Um, we were commissioned, I was working with a, with a fellow, Patrick McDonough, um, a fellow educator and artist, Patrick McDonough. We were commissioned by the city, the Department of Energy and Environment, uh, to envision a system of uh, wayfinding kind of markers that would be installed at various points within the DC 100-year uh, floodplain. And so these are actually one-to-one -one kind of sculptural infographics that are actually showing the both historic and future flooding scenarios. And so they're kind of color-coded to show um, just different, um, different histories and uh, uh, possibilities um, to kind of bring, promote um, environmental literacy and, and flooding awareness uh, in DC. So those red ones there are actually historic markers, whereas the, the yellow, blue, and black are, are future scenarios. This was a more recent one that was installed at the wharf. This one, this one, I think it's like 15 feet high off the ground. So the water could get that high in a 500 year storm. Um, and so this was, I don't know, a really fascinating project to work on. We actually ended up were working really closely with the Army Corps of Engineers. They su supplied a lot of uh, data um, that they had modeled, like a lot of like depth grids and stuff to, to try to, um, and we, you know, worked with us and we, the, our goal of the project was ultimately to, you know, consider ways to like, how do you image uh, flood risk, right? It's ultimately kind of, uh, it's an unseen thing, right? You don't see a line along the ground that says this is a hundred year, this is where the hundred year flood line is. So how do we, how do we try to communicate apparent risk, but also, um, you know, invoke action. So this is, uh, these are one of three that are installed in the flood, in the floodplain. Really fun project. Um, next is Dias Flora, which I think was the first opportunity for me to try to braid these. Uh, the, the previous project was sort of like an ecological concern. This, and the one before that was a kind of uh, more forwardly cultural narrative that we were trying to bring forward, whereas this one tries to do both of those. Um, and so we were using plants uh, and um, uh, the census data to uh, try to um, illustrate certain migratory patterns within DC, namely the movement of black folks uh, into and out of DC over the city's founding. So what you're seeing is this kind of linear contour in the background uh, creating a sort of fence is, is actually the census data for the black population in DC since its founding in 1790 all the way up to, I think, 2010 was the most recent census uh, at the time. And so what you can see at the beginning, um, this would have been, you know, kind of the colonial area, era of D.C., um, and then rose to almost 70, something, almost 80 percent at its, at its height in the, in the 70s. Um, and so D.C., at a certain point, I think in the 50s, became, uh, I believe, the first uh, majority black city, um, uh, sort of um, affectionately known as Chocolate City, um, in, in the country. And you can see as the last couple of decades has been tapering off. And so we were trying to make a comment about gentrification and, and, and who actually has a right kind of to the city. Um, yeah, and so each of these bars indicated a decade. See that profile there. And then to simulate that movement of people, we invited people, we invited uh, community members to kind of come up and take plants away, take home, take plants home with them. So it was kind of, trying to simulate this sort of regional diaspora um, that, we were, that we were sort of speculating on. And that takes us, I think, to this sort of ongoing project
project that, um, that I've been working on, Drylong So. Drylong So is derived from the Gullah Geechee language um, down in, um, mostly in, well, in, in South Carolina, but this word also shows up in blues music throughout the, the Gulf Coast. And it basically just means uh, same old or every day. Um, I sort of, um, oh, this is me sort of trying to draw a line around where I think the South is. Um, uh, but I have kind of interpreted the, the dry long so uh, as uh, the ordinary black every day, right? And, and all the stuff that is bound up within um, everyday black life. Um, there are quite a few folks that have been thinking or have invoked this term to, to think about black ordinariness um, and, and the sophistication and the kind of profoundness of, of those activities. The first one, this word actually was introduced to me through my professor at Howard, um, my theory professor at Howard, William Wesley Taylor, and he was looking at um, everything from jazz clubs to porches and trying to unpack uh, the sort of sociocultural potential in those, those spaces. Um, John Langston Gwaltney was also looking at, um, uh, he interviewed a, you know, a bunch of what he called dry long so black folks across kind of working, working class black folks um, to try to constitute this multivalent account or multivalent registration of, of blackness in the country. And then Colleen Smith, uh, who has a, a film of the same name, who um, is, is basically sort of grappling with the, the messiness and the complications of, of black life, um, specifically in Oakland. Um, this project um, ultimately landed in sort of my first um, iteration of thinking about the specific ways that black folks interact with land. And, uh, and in this case, I end up um, being you know, so, a bit self-referential and, and situating this work uh, directly in my hometown back in uh, Farmville or in Prospect, which is sort of a village outside of, outside of Farmville. Uh, and was uh, essentially did what John uh, Waltney did, which was call back uh, home, literally phone calls um, back to several members of my family, all women, uh, to try to unpack, you know, what it meant for uh, certain members of my family to grow up near that farmland, and what does it mean? What did it mean for them as women, as mothers, as daughters, um, and and what? Uh, can that offer us? For me, I guess it was, it was more so like um, me inviting myself to try to discover value and what does it mean for black folks to occupy space? Uh, and what does that mean for the discipline? What kinds of um, things can we learn from, from, from uh, black folks just kind of occupying space unapologetically? And so I called my grandmother, you know, everyone from my grandmother who was 95 at the time down to my sister who was 25 at the time um, and uh, created the, translated these oral kind of histories, these, I guess you would think of that as kind of qualitative data, um, to try to understand or try to unpack uh, this sort of, or create a kind of thick description of black, uh, what it meant for a black landscape in the South, and then sort of just created this uh, exhibition. It was part research, part exhibition in this gallery space. Project is really personal to me. Um, and then, I guess, so I went back to school. I'm in school now, I'm at the GSD. Um, and what's been funny is um, I've, been having a lot, I've been having a lot of fun, as I was saying earlier, not sort of performing as a student, and also thinking about ways that uh, I can um, ensure that this time of, you know, that I'm back in school is uh, ultimately relevant to all the stuff that I've talked about up to this point. And so every opportunity that I've been given or have taken has been an it has been uh, sort of a case study in me uh, co-opting sort of assignments and prompts to, to think really critically about like how black folks take care of ourselves, how black folks show up in the world, how black folks, um, uh, just, just how, we, how we gather, how we, how we uh, share and produce knowledge. This was a project that I did with a classmate, Kiki Cooper, um, in which uh, we uh, sort of sourced the uh, black GSD WhatsApp uh, and um, just asked, just mined all of that, all those conversations for the different ways that black folks um, 
at the GSD in particular, uh, care for themselves? So everything from, obviously Boston's not the most diverse city, where do you go, where do black folks go to get their hair done? Where do black folks get their nails done? Where do you get their hair cut? Where do you go to exercise? Where do you go to, um, to socialize? And then we started to try to think about how do you map, how do you map this? How do you map essentially what is kind of an epistolary um, format um, over, over space and over land? And so this was our attempt of trying to map uh, what we were calling kind of black networks of care uh, in the Boston region using the GSD kind of as a, as a data set. Um, and then this was a set of journey maps where we literally looked, uh, we interviewed um, various uh, peers of ours and think, you know, just to try to get a sense of what does it mean for them to come from all the way from Cambridge to get all the way down to Mattapan to get their hair done, sometimes often taking hours because of the, it started to really show um, lack of, of, of transit access and just the amount of labor, right, that you have to do um, that to, to take care of one's black body um, in a city like Boston. Um, so this was, this was really just us, um, I think, trying to, on the one hand, celebrate the means that black folks take care of themselves, but also highlight uh, the barriers that, um, that show up when, 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 we, when we do have to show, uh, kind of take care of ourselves within a kind of white or non-black context. This project, I think, um, I'm hoping I, I have an opportunity to, to keep studying on, but this project was actually part of um, a course that I, I just finished with Daniel Choi, uh, who was in, who's teaching in the landscape department at the GSD, called Environmental Histories, Archived Landscapes. And this class uh, was uh, ultimately an invitation uh, for us to uh, sort of demystify the archive um, and, and demystify these kind of hyper-institutional spaces that don't really seem inviting and ultimately kind of historically have been these kind of gatekeepers of, of uh, information and to not only, you know, take up space in those, in, in those kind of institutions or those, those aspects of, of the institution, but to um, start to think critically about what we can find in some of these collections that are sort of tucked away into these, these uh, uh, kind of dark and dusty um, parts of the of, uh, of libraries. And so I ended up finding this uh, set of letters that was written by um, a black family, the Carter family in the 19th century, um, actually between, back and forth between Gloucester, Virginia and Richmond, Virginia, so now just an hour from my hometown. Um, Polly Carter, which is what this letter here is from, uh, was actually an enslaved woman in a plant, on a plantation in Gloucester, Virginia, who was writing to her son, um, uh, Hamilton Carter, this gentleman. And so there's this collection of, like, this kind of constellation of people. Um, it was almost just like writing, reading emails, right? but like written in the 19th century at a time when actually black folks weren't allowed to read or write. Um, and um, I was really just kind of fascinated by the different means of, uh, of sharing that, became, that kind of emerged in the reading of these letters. So in one case, the mother asks her son if, she can, if he can send his father a bit of tobacco. Um, on the other hand, uh, she mentions that, you know, her white, you know, mentions her white family, which I thought was really interesting because they're enslaved. Um, and so as I'm studying all these letters and I'm like kind of looking through the, 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 the artifacts themselves, uh, it becomes apparent to me that this act, the act of writing the, uh, and, the, and the paper and the ink that was implicated in this, the, this, this collection, uh, certain aspects of this would have been illegal or would have been hyper-political because of the illegality of, uh, you know, not only black literacy, but the sharing of black, uh, of information uh, in, this, in this way. Um, and uh, I wanted to just see what, hap what kind of questions would happen, would, would emerge if I just tried to map uh, the mobility of these letters. Um, so this is me sort of just trying to understand the collection and index the collection. So, in this case, the, uh, the dotted lines uh, are where letters are leaving from. The, dash line, the solid lines are where letters are coming in. So you can see most of the letters um, are going from Gloucester to Richmond with, with a few outliers. And in this case, I'm trying to actually map the kind of, uh, this is like a sociogram of like um, who's sending letters to whom. Um, again, so Hamilton Carter is the, is the main 
person in this the system of exchanges, um, the lines that are coming into the left of the names are like, you know, those are the letters that are received. The ones to the right of the names are like the ones that are going out. So you can see, in this case, like a lot of people are writing to Hamilton, but he's kind of leaving a lot of people on red, so to speak, not many letters going out. Um, and so this is, uh, you know, I'm just really fascinated by like how all these black folks were able to write to and from each other over such a long period of time. Again, some of these letters were stretching from the 1850s, pre-American Civil War, all the way into, well into the, re the Reconstruction era. Um, and I began getting fascinated with the characteristics of the paper itself. And it occurred to me, um, you know, how do you, how would I, what is, how do you surface uh, the, 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 the elephant in the room, which was like, how did black folks getting paper to write this stuff um, in the first place? Um, and that kind of became the impetus for this um, final study, which was what if black folks made their own paper? Um, and so I ended up trying to speculate on that question, and I ended up making my own paper um, out of things that they might have had on hand, things like collard greens and okra and mugwort. Um, the one on the left is the one without uh, recycled paper at it, so it was, it was almost like dried kale. It was very fragile and lacy. The one on the right incorporated recycled paper and resembled something more like paper. Um, but it occurred to me that there's so many things in the making of this process, there were so many things that you could encode the paper with without even having to write anything. You could alter the color, you can alter the amount of recycled paper, you can alter the fragility. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I think um, it was, for me, this project illustrated how uh, sort of just the act of indexing, the act of trying to um, make something, make, make data out of apparently not something that doesn't feel like data. Um, how that can kind of pose some really interesting questions and how that can sort of invite speculation. Which is what I think kind of sets, sets us up for the, what, I'll, what I'll speak on last, which is this AI stuff. Um, so I've been, I've been really fascinated by uh, Stephanie Dinkins' work, who has been, I think, thinking really critically and, and has been um, doing some really timely writing uh, and, and practicing on the intersections of race and uh, artificial intelligence and how we can use AI to, um, I think, kind of repair uh, narratives as they pertain to blackness, but also speculate on futures that are, that were not, um, uh, that black folks just, for one reason or another, were not, are, are not able to realize or were not able to realize. Um, and so this, 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 um, this idea that we can kind of, you know, speculate freely, um, she refers to as sort of an Afro-nowism, like speculating on the current. Um, and she says, how do we, you know, what, like, after this idea of Afro-nowism asks us how we can liberate our minds from the infinite loop of repression and oppositional thinking that America imposes upon those of us forcibly enjoined to this nation. And so the question that she's posing is not only what injustice are you fighting against, but what do you in your heart of hearts want to create? Right, so that's the, for me, that was the paper. Um, that was kind of a, a, an analog uh, act of Afro-nowism, me trying to speculate on the current. Um, I've been putting that idea of Afro-nowism into practice um, by, again, looking at my own lived experience, looking at home, looking at uh, certain tropes of black culture, um, uh, that for me, uh, well, I think for many maybe seem kind of banal again or mundane or but for me actually seem quite profound and, and if not you know although customary this is a photo from farmville from prospect from that farm uh, and this is a common trope that you see throughout the south of folks just black folks just repurposing things as planters so this is a bathtub a sink um being in prickly pear which um yeah just growing growing out of out of these fixtures and i thought what if this was just a custom, what if this was a custom that you would see in Harlem? Um, and I ended up creating these scenes uh, using Mid Journey. So this is me just trying to think again, like what would life look like if black folks were left to their own devices and allowed to live in abundance? Um, and I think what, um, what I've been realizing is that this, is I think different than say Afrofuturism, which a lot of folks have used to describe this series of work. Um, futurism, I think, uh, for me, is 
extent, like is trying to look at the distant future, um, at which point everything is kind of on the table for speculation. We can kind of make up what people will be wearing. We can make up what people, what the world will look like, what the politics will look like, what the governance will look like, what, what, what languages people will, will be speaking. Um, we can even look to the distant past, like historical fiction, and, and, and um, sort of speculate on what already happened. I think for me, it's a more interesting and maybe even harder project to think, so what does it mean to be nostalgic of the, of the, of the, of the now? And what does it mean to speculate on the present? Um, and I think that's, that's really what I have been uh, having a lot of fun with, kind of braiding past, present, and future, and kind of collapsing them into this moment, these scenes that are kind of hard to place in time. Um, another Gullah Geechee reference, this is a common custom, again, in South Carolina. This uh, practice is done um, uh, where these, these women, are mostly women, are braiding baskets, these really ornate baskets out of uh, sweet grass, but sometimes also pine needles and other plant-based matter. Um, and I, I was thinking, like, if these women have this, this knowledge that they've been carrying that can be traced back, that is traced back to the, the African continent, that they've, they've been um, harboring for, for centuries, um, why, why keep this, this knowledge at the scale of the object, at the scale of the basket? Um, why can't this knowledge be scaled up to, let's say, a wall assembly um, or have like wicker homes or a wicker, wicker facade or a sweet grass facade? Um, this is a, Gordon, a lovely uh, Gordon Parks photo just showing, I think, or highlighting the, the richness and the importance, the prevalence of the front porch um, in Southern black culture. Um, and obviously this is a, is a kind of a natural uh, sort of um, customary extension of, of, the, of, the, of the home uh, using the same materials, uh, in this case wood, but what if it was something else, like inflated plastic? Um, so again, <laughs> just having fun sort of being a little bit absurd, but not by much. Like these are all things that are plausible, again, if, if black folks were allowed to um, just kind of live uh, sort of on their own terms. And then lastly, uh, I'll share um, this trip that I've been I've been thinking about a lot, which is um, stemming with stemming from uh, the, the the sort of prevalence of watermelon as a kind of shorthand for um, black laziness, um, black uh, uh, audacity, um, as it's been kind of weaponized in the 20th century and in, uh, in, in, Jim Crow, in the Jim Crow South in particular. Um, Watermelon has kind of been used in, in this like you know racist way to the point that it almost becomes um, shameful in a certain context for Black folks to consume watermelon in public, um, and so I, I uh, to kind of push back against uh, that trope and that and that history, um, I sort of used uh, Mid Journey to um, envision um, obviously watermelons float because they're mostly air and water. Um, what if they were just you know, hundreds of these were just floated down the Anacostia River in, a, in this kind of joyous um, occasion. So I, I, for me, I think this is, these are opportunities for, um, for black folks also to imagine. I think for um, folks that are not black to even imagine um, or to think of ways that they might feel hindered by some, certain aspects, some aspects of the world or how they show up in the world and, and think of ways that they can kind of um, push back uh, against, against that, against those forces. And then to, I guess to wrap up here, I'll just share about 50 seconds or so of audio from the Dry Lung So Oral History Project. This was a conversation with my mother that I think uh, helps to, she, she shares a lot of the sentiments, I think that uh, for me animate a lot of the, the sort of importance of this work um, and, and why I, I like it's kind of illustrating what's at stake, I think, for me and, and a lot of the work that I've shared with you all today. Uh, sorry, that's here. It's uh, sitting here talking with you, brought, mm -hmm. of course, brought back so, so many memories and questions along with it. And the foods that mm. was prepared, mm -hmm. Kool-Aid, dumping that sugar in it. Hmm. 
<laughs> corn pudding, running outside after a storm, jumping in a mud hole, and then mud oozing up through your toes, eating eating the, the dirt. Oh, it tasted so good. Eating the dirt. Yeah, eating dirt. Dirt was good, man. <laughs> Especially after it rained. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard that. Yeah, it, it was good. It was good. <laughs> yeah, eating some dirt was good. All of that is, 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 is who I am and what I am and what I continue to look forward to continue to become and to be. Because mm-hmm. it's not over. It's not over until it's all said and done. I'm still growing and I'm still learning. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, I'm still growing, still learning, and I still want to instill th- instill things in you and instill things in Carol uh, and share so that you all won't forget. Thank you all. Great. Thanks so much for the presentation, Curry. I, from my point of view, it's like it's so great to see some of the backstory behind some of these images, but then also just like there's a bit of a through line through your work, at least for me, of whatever kind of subject matter that you encounter, or tools or data sets, whether that be water lines or you know census population statistics or even tools like AI. There's like a an impulse in you and always to like root it back to kind of like place and people and culture and that's like it's great because it's like the kind of tools the subject matters the collaborations they never dilute the kind of central focus which i find super interesting yeah okay so then i'm going to turn it to the room i have a mic over here if anyone who has a question could please raise their hand and i'll run the mic over to you Hi, thank you for your presentation. Um, oh. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, I have a question for, um, you mentioned Afrofuturism as being um, something more speculative and being in a distant future. Um, but for afro um I would I, I would ask like aren't don't those two concepts like go hand in hand because um, a lot of it is like what is a scenario so I want to hear like what you would say like the biggest similarity for you are between those two concepts. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I mean, I think it's really more it's a it's a it's a matter of scale, right? I think it's. Sometimes I feel like these things, the, the series that I'm doing, they could happen tomorrow, they could happen next year, they could have happened 30 years ago. So there's, there's this kind of plus or minus, you know, 30, 30 years or so, but it's relative to the present. I think Afrofuturism, for me, at, at least how it shows up in kind of pop culture, like a Wakanda obviously kind of comes to mind, um, as this kind of almost otherworldly, like we... Uh, it, it just it feels like a, like a place that we have to invent to kind of access, right? It's not something that I could like, I, could, I don't feel, I don't have the sense that I could get on a plane and fly to Wakanda, right? That being said, I think what is important is the intent behind both of these kind of schools of thought. Not that they're even mutually exclusive, which is not really how I'm, I want to frame them, but it's really like they're both, like they're both um, sort of um, giving permission for black folks to dream. I think is really what the underlying point is there. Um, because I think to imagine what liberation can look like for black folks, you kind of have to think beyond what is possible or what is actual. Um, and so I think they're certainly in dialogue with each other. I think for me, you know, it, it's, it's really helpful to use, um, it's really helpful to use what we already do and just scale them or place them in ways that are a little uncanny to sort of unlock, get folks that may have not 
seen this or may have, uh, you know, kind of uh, just kind of brushed off the, the significance of being able to grow plants in a bathtub or, that, you know, um, or the placemaking, I should say, the placemaking potential of growing plants in a, pet, in, in, a, in a bathtub. For me, that's a useful device for us to think um, in a kind of futuristic way. Um, does that answer your question? Yes, thank yeah. you. Hi, thank you so much. That was really beautiful to watch. Um, I had such a similar question, so I had to quickly formulate another one. But I'm really curious how you reconcile both this nowism and this futurism and the overall black narrative in the context of broader issues that take something like climate change. Um, and I'm asking this coming from a place of a lot of the work I do is around looking at like indigenous and black economics um, and thinking about how that might be applied to say like post-capitalist modes of being at a hyper-local level. My question is how do you reconcile that and recognize the lessons that, are to be, that, are, that we can learn without fetishizing hmm. the black experience? Because I think that's something that comes up a lot and to give like a very specific example, in my work, even this question of like, we can learn from indigenous practices still feels like an othering. And so when you have conversations like this in broader context, so I'm thinking of like the work that you did in DC with the water levels and stuff, like as your the, those concentric circles of impact get larger and larger, and what you're studying becomes relevant to other issues, non-black issues, if there's such a thing, um, how do you avoid that fetishization? How do you continually have that dialogue in a way that is um, reflective and accurate and, and dynamic? I don't know if that makes sense. I hope that no, makes sense. I, I think so. And it's a really great question. It's something that I thought about a lot and wanted to handle with a lot of care when I moved to the University of Um for some of the reasons that I mentioned, right? And um, I'll use an anecdote as I, in a way that I hope answers your question. Um, but when I first got there, and we were, I was first saying, yeah, we're gonna be talking about black stuff. That's just what we're gonna be doing this, this semester. And the first question in, in almost every class was, so are we creating black architecture? And I was like, no, I don't think that's possible because no one here is black. <laughs> um, so, um, the point is like that's not actually the point is to like make a black architecture, right? Um, it's it's more so to like study what um, study with rigor and with care, um, uh, you know, histories and kind of these these tropes of cultural production and try to unpack um, what is um, what what is working um, and what can be kind of extrapolated to a kind of more generic um, populace. Um, so again, I think for me, it's, 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 it's useful for us to think in ways that, again, those blur those lines between public and private um, uh, domains or indoor and outdoor. That means, that, that's for me, that you could easily like, map that onto uh, like an architectural context. And that means all of a sudden we have to start thinking about property. And do we give up on, on property and, and models of ownership? Do we give up on hard encodings of, of, of space, right? So I think there's ways to um, distill what black folks uh, are doing in certain contexts uh, and, 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 and um, just think really smartly about um, how they could be useful in getting us to think really radically about, again, modes of governance, modes of ownership, um, modes of stewardship. Um, I, I don't know that it has to be a kind of one-to-one. -one. Um, I think it almost has to be in a kind of, a, a, maybe a necessarily appropriative act. Hi, yes, I just wanted to reiterate how beautiful this presentation was and how awe-inspiring it. I've never heard of the term Afro-Nowism and now I want to use that in everyday conversation. Um, but I really appreciated your dedication to visualizing data. Um, in the beginning of your earlier projects kind of are rendering graphs as fences, kind of as like playground material um, and this like very specific you have this very specific attention to like visualizing 
um, data, but also kind of like climate risks. And I just, as someone who's in architecture school, I'm just very curious, like what is the next step beyond visualizing? Um, we're seeing these beautiful moments of just like what it looks like to experience Afro, Afro, Afro nowism in these images. Um, we're seeing sort of this extrapolated data where you're kind of zooming out to the scale of like a map. And it feels like I want to find that space in between from going from like visualizing these very specific moments to, I don't want to say action because you're taking action, but like what is the next step after visualizing? Come up more so with the AI work. Like my computer. Give me a second. Is there a plug over here? Is there a plug for the I guess it might I guess it's not. Um, I think that question has come up, um, or those thoughts have come up more so with the AI work, because at the end of the day, these are all visual speculations. I do think, as you're suggesting, there is a lot of richness and maybe timeliness to the act of imagining. Um, so, but a lot of folks, what I, <laughs> the detractors in the comments making the hot takes on Instagram, uh, um, one of the main commentary uh, towards the beginning of this series was that, uh, oh, there's real history that, you know, what, you know, like you shouldn't be fabricating, blah, blah, blah. Um, but I was like, well, no, there's, there's black folks in the future too. And so we kind of have to imagine, we have to kind of imagine those. Um, and so I am, fascinated with the possibility of these things actually just becoming, these scenes just becoming real, or the, pot the potential for these to become real. Um, I, when I first started just putting these out in the world, I thought that they were just kind of stay um, sort of objects, like, or, or, or images. They wouldn't, you know, folks wouldn't actually literally be inspired to um, literally do this in, in Harlem, but a lot of folks have been saying, actually, no, I want collard greens in my wedding bouquet, or I, you know, am really interested in using quilts now um, as a, a tent church in the woods. Um, so a lot of these are other series that I have on the, in the Instagram series, but um, I, I think what my suspicion is from the, I guess, what, what my um, sort of thought is now on we need to kind of imagine in order for action to become possible or, or real is kind of starting to bear out. I think folks are really just wanting to find ways to put these scenes uh, directly into practice. So for me, that's enough. If literally any one of these or any aspect of these became true, um, then the kind of moot, the, the point of like we have real history, you should be doing that, that becomes moot because then the thing becomes history, right? Um, does that answer your question? Okay, cool. Hey, okay, thanks, thanks so much. It was really um, inspiring as you, as you can hear from all the questions. But I'd like to, for a minute, bring it back to, since we're the, um, masters of computational design practices. And, you know, I think the, the, um, the reason we invited you was twofold, right? One, because of this amazing practice that you've just defined yourself um, in terms of your own identity and um, how there's all kinds of things that are necessary in the world for you to be able to do, you know, to, yeah. And then, but the second is about um, uh, computation and, and all of these tools. And so I notice, um, on the one hand, um, a backlash against computation in, in, in the, you know, going back to the basket weaving and the, right, right all of these re reclaiming um, tools of indigeneity or uh, decolonization, all of, right, all of that, that, that range of things. But on the other hand, you're very excited about this Instagram network, <laughs> and and the you know and the images are so powerful and fresh and lively and you know, so 
this, this, I would love to know um, sort of why you're so excited about that on the, um, because there's so much harm that's also been done through, right, these networks, right, polarization and racism and a hate, hate uh, you know, hate the, probably you, you don't only get positive um, comments, right? And so, um, so uh, I want to get to the question though, <laughs> which I'm not sure exactly what it is, but just how you, recon how you reconcile um, those, those things, because for me, it's not about taking this image, making it real, right? That's the power of art is not only about, it is real, and, and there's so many things about it that are real enough, right? It's, right? And like, so, um, so I'm just curious in terms of moving forward, and especially, right, you're at the GSD, there's all these computational methods, and you say, I'm going to map that. Like, how do you, how do you see these tools as amplifying what you're doing, or how do you see yourself rescripting some of those codes and tools to be able to turn something into a different of reality so it's a it's a kind of an abstract question but I and I don't expect one one answer right but I'm just like curious like what were some of the bad images that you got before the ones that you liked you know maybe right so that so that you sort of get into yeah. into the nit nitty grittiness of the yuckiness of the of the tools yeah sure no, I mean I, I I love the you know where where we we kind of landed actually because uh, Something that I'm very transparent about on Instagram uh, is I can put you know we 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 I end up with these like kind of slick images right, um, but there is a lot of labor behind the scenes, not only curating the slickest of the image images, but there's dozens uh, and dozens and dozens of iterations that go into this um, or. Um, this is actually a really funny example because when I first tried to make this series, Mid Journey would not allow me because it thought I was being racist. Yeah, yeah. Um, because it's AI powered moderation um, was concerned that uh, black and watermelon in the same prompt meant that there was a bad actor that was trying to create some sort of racist imagery. Um, and so, you know, there's there's so much labor, and, and I've been DMing with Stephanie Dinkins actually about this. Uh, we kind of have shared this fr frustration, is that um, so much labor to get here is actually just finding ways to either push through or sneak past um, the kind of problematic defaults for black folks. Uh, if you put in black people, it defaults to black men mostly. If you put in black children, it's mostly black boys. Um, so there's like there's still a lot of things that um, need to be done. My sort of position is um, specifically to AI is um, I don't know that we can put the toothpaste back in the tube, so to speak. Like that this is the technology that we're almost certainly going to have to live with and is going to touch many aspects of our lives in the next several years. Um, and so I feel like black folks at the very least need to kind of be literate in um, the complications of how this technology is developed, how it's deployed, and I ideally influence how it's governed. Um, and, and so I think for me, like if there is uh, an opportunity to use AI in this kind of use case, or have, you know, kind of invent these kind of use cases for AI, there's a potential, um, yeah, use cases yeah, for AI, then there's a potential for there to be more responsible uh, outcomes, I think, as it, as it pertains to black folks. Because I do think um, something that I've been kind of taking in with you know, the, crit the crit criticism is that I, you know, I'm acknowledging that um, specifically as it pertains to black folks, like, like black folks, I think, are wary of how history is authored um, and how black folks show up and don't show up in certain historical narratives. So there is, an, I think, the tools that we are uh, developing uh, ideally or ostensibly would also mean that we have more sophisticated means of repairing harm. But, uh, or I think it's got to be a kind of um, feedback loop, right, where there's, there's, there's ways that black folks have 
been sharing stories and, and, and share knowledge and produce knowledge that should also be informing this school. So I, I, I don't know. I'm, I have very complicated feelings about this that aren't fully resolved. But my sort of takeaway, I guess, is that there's, there's room for, um, there's a lot of need, obviously, for repair, but I think it also just means that we kind of need to, black folks also need to give ourselves permission to be in the room um, so that we can kind of be um, either inventing our own tools for that repair um, or influencing the, de the decisions that, that may or may not kind of be getting that repair. Yeah, thanks. Okay. So what did you say to, Maj how did you get Midjourney to let you? Black to African American and watermelon to melon. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> and it was like, ding, cool. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, anyway, those stories are great. Yeah. Um, hello, thank you for um, sharing this, yeah, this beautiful work and the stories with your family and stuff, it's very inspiring. Um, I guess I've been trying to like formulate this question in my head. Um, kind of uh, off the back of that, like how do you think about, um, like I think a lot of your work has like touched on the relation of um, like black people to digital space um, through communication means, um, sort of, you know, in this work with Midjourney of, um, and how, uh, how we sort of show up um, in systems that are like biased in, um, you know, sort of centering how, you know, systems that like are making a way when there is sort of like no way, I guess, um, and, uh, you know, thinking about how black people also show up, you know, in other places on, like, you know, social media, um, and, um, yeah, I, I guess I'm curious to, like, hear um, how you think about, uh, I guess, like, black people in digital space, um, you know, more, I guess, like expanding, not just from a place of um, inspiration, like inspiring, you know, things to come about, but, um, and it was great to hear, like, uh, you know, like also the sense of ownership and I guess um, authoring systems and spaces that um, can sort of skirt at like a higher level the, um, the, um, the biases that like disadvantage, you know, us from, you know, creating images like this, for example. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I don't know, I'm <laughs> curious to hear you like expand on, I guess, like the role of like black people and um, not the role, but I guess like the relation of, of black people in digital space. Yeah, what, what, sorry, what was the word that you were using in front of space? Or? Um. I, black people in digital space. What what did I say before that? No, no. Like so, you said black folks and something space. I just can't hear the digital. Digital space. Yeah. Oh, I say. Uh, okay, okay. So you're saying like, what is the role of black folks that sort of in in creating digital spaces? Or um, I just want to make sure I understand your question. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. I don't know. No, we got we got we got that down pat. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know how to do that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, like going back to where you know in your class in um, South Carolina or, or Virginia or wherever it was um, of like charting the movement of you know blackness is like this very um, kind of impromptu mm. sort of. Um, like raw organic thing um, and how that was like how you know you work with students to kind of help like codify that um, and you know to your project with uh, you know exploring how other GSD members sort of you know like um, access other networks of you know people and other parts of the black experience um, and how you know you were beginning to get at like how um, 
you know, digital space and communi communication tools help connect us um, to, to those um, things. Uh, yeah, like, I guess, like, do you maybe have a more, um, do you have more, like, thoughts, I guess, on how, you know, like, that sort of impromptu nature of making systems work that weren't, you know, sort of um, uh, like how they were developed how for, you know, to, to help, I guess, create a connection through those communities, um, how does that extend to digital space where, you know, a lot of, you know, blackness of, you know, black Twitter or thinking about, like, inspiration of the things that help power, you know, TikTok and the black dances and how the, you know, algorithms disadvantage creators and stuff like that. Like, I guess, do you have an extension of that thought into digital spaces? Um, the short answer is probably no. But that's mostly because I'm still, like, this work is, like, so digital. I mean, there's also, like, a lot of kind of uh, work that I'm bringing to myself that is lived or that I've uh, uh, kind of curated or have banked in my head already that I'm just trying to, like, sort of uh, re recast in a, in a different way. Um, and it just so happens that social media has been, like, a really uh, sort of emergent medium for me. That's, that seems to be out. Um, what I um, what I think though is that there's always going to be um, a kind of emergence, or there's always going to be a kind of scrappiness um, that I think Black folks are already kind of comfortable with, um, kind of making kind of making do um, uh, attitude towards towards life um, that will kind of that gets mapped into the digital space. I don't think that those two are able to be coupled, and I, I think when you I, I think. Um, when you uh, even look at like, Black Twitter is a really good example because I feel like there's, um, it's it's funny how like analog Black life will get recast into the digital space. Things will happen in the digital space on say in, on Twitter, and then we'll jump back out and back into the analog. There's this kind of really fascinating uh, feedback loop, I think, that happens between how black folks converse digitally and how black folks in the round. Um, and so I think that there's, I mean, in a way that's, that's yeah, I'm still, I'm still thinking through what the potential is for black folks to kind of exist in the digital and, and, and what it means to be real, real and black. Um, but I, but I, I feel like I'm, I'm personally fascinated with, again, like the, the, the potential and uh, how often like black kind of cultural, black digital cultural artifacts jump into and out of the digital. Um, I don't know if there is ways that we could think more intentionally about what those interfaces could be, but it's, it's, it is kind of hilarious that like TikTok dancing is done like at the club now um, instead of just kind of living in, on, online. But also just to see like that AAVE African American vernacular English get shaped almost in a daily, almost reshaped on a daily basis because of some silly thing that somebody said online, right? Um, that then gets that like, jumps back out into the into the into the reality. So I think that there's um, the same ways that I think Black folks have managed to uh, kind of navigate certain systems of oppression or surveillance or what have you. Um, I, I, I don't see that being really a hindrance. Uh, it's, it seems to be almost like a bug right now, um, especially as it, as it pertains to the, the digital space. Um, but I, I think that that being said, there's, there's it's a real black culture, still black cultural, it's still the thing that we have to kind of understand and, and preserve and protect. Um, and so we still want to, I think, have actors uh, in, in the room to kind of make sure that that, 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 that happens. Thank you. Anyone else? Probably be our last one, unless anyone else has a question after Elizabeth. Okay. Um, 
Thank you so much for sharing your work with us and I guess reminding us that the imagine, imagination is more than just an escape and it can actually physically affect our world. Um, so I was just referring to your discussion with Laura about the defaults in um, artificial intelligence and the tools related to that. Uh, and approaching these tools, oh, sorry, approaching these tools and technologies critically as we work towards being in the room and towards being more literate. Um, are there ways of thinking or working or interacting with these tools that you think might be helpful in um, retraining or dealing with the biases, whether intentional or unintentional, that are coded into the way that these tools work and conceptualize our world? Yeah, that's something, um, and again, I'll, I'll mention Stephanie Hink's work. That's something that she's actually actively working towards. Um, there seems to be at least some interest in uh, a black AI. I don't know what that can look like, but I, I know like folks have been testing, um, you know, language models basically that are that are based on you know black ephemera uh, or you know that may be crowdsourced, which would be really interesting. And maybe we have to start maybe inventing new modes of archival practice, um, and maybe even just uh, thinking differently about what is worth um, maintaining or, or uh, sorry preserving and. and Curating in, into a like what what is a data set basically I think is like the big question and what does that mean for what does that mean for Black folks um, I think that's something that I would love to see and maybe even be a part of um, something that I didn't think about until more recently um, is that Mid Journey is also learning from the outputs of people's prompts so um, it's I think a fact that this work is at some small level working to kind of train, um, you know, mid-journey to do better in, in, in how it's uh, depicting black folks, right? I think if um, black joy, black uh, agency, black abundance, black liberation was a default, right? Um, and and that, that kind of multiplicity, that abundance also cuts across uh, gender, age, uh, geography, et cetera, then that um, that probably spells like a really you know for like that probably creates like a really interesting way of rendering Black life uh, as it as it pertains to AI. Um, I think that's yeah that's kind of how I've been thinking about it recently. Um, I think I would love to kind of rehearse um, you know ways of using this tech. Uh, these tools um, in a pedagogical, in a teaching, like in, like in a kind of academic learning uh, environment, um, especially at a place like, say, Howard, where, you know, I think, yeah, I, I wonder what, um, given the right prompts or given the right kind of learning, learning environment, like what, what, might be, what might we build when students are kind of in, invited to imagine worlds that we're not reacting to so I think that there's there's probably like analog, like real life uh, impacts for using these tools, like that can actually kind of impact and influence how we think about the world. But I think there's also um, just the use of the materials in these kind of emergent ways likely also has an impact on the AI um, and how the AI trains itself or how, how it thinks. Thank you. Great. Well, thanks everyone for coming. Thanks for the fantastic conversation and thanks Curry for the lecture. Thank you.